St. Luke's. Welcome to worship this weekend. I'm glad that you've joined us. Thanks to all of you who are joining us from near and far for these online worship videos. Thanks again for being in touch and staying connected and finding creative and innovative ways to be the church even in these difficult times. I'm here again in our sanctuary. I'm by myself and I just it feels strange, but I know that we're together, united in the Spirit, and as in we anticipate the day of Pentecost, we trust that the Spirit still works in us, still unites us, still empowers us, and that we're not truly alone. This is the last Sunday in the season of Easter as we now anticipate the day of Pentecost. And uh, in these days between Ascension and Pentecost, we gather with the disciples in the upper room, waiting for the Spirit to transform the church around the world. In today's gospel, Jesus prays for his followers and for their mission in his name. Amid religious, social, economic divisions, we seek the unity that Jesus had with the Father, made one in baptism. We go forth to live our faith in the world, eager for the unity that God intends for the whole human family. found, especially in these days of isolation and quarantine, that it's been especially powerful to see things that are familiar, to see things that feel normal. So here I am at our font, in the middle of our sanctuary, standing by myself, but trusting that I am not alone. And I hope this image of the font reminds you that you are a part of a faith family that is strong, that is connected, that is present with you, even now. And in these waters of baptism, we continue to be knit together, even though we are apart. So I invite you now to get a bowl of water and get ready to give thanks for the gift of baptism. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are raised with him to new life. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. And now if you're by yourself, I would invite you to put the sign of the cross on your forehead. If you're with others, take turns marking the sign of the cross on their foreheads, as together we remember we are God's children, called and claimed. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning you created us in your image. You planted us in a well-watered garden. In the desert, you promised pools of water for the parched. You gave us water to drink from the rock. We did not know the way. You sent the good shepherd to lead us to still waters. At the cross, you watered us from Jesus' wounded side. And on this day, you shower us again with the waters of life. We praise you for your salvation through water, for the water in this font and for water everywhere. Bathe us in your forgiveness, grace, and love. Satisfy the thirsty and give us the life only you can give. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Would you please now join me in the prayer of the day? O God of glory, your Son, Jesus Christ, suffered for us and ascended to your right hand. Unite us with Christ and each other in suffering and in joy. 
and that all the world may be drawn into your bountiful presence through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hi, hallelujah, friends. It's Melinda here. I hope you're doing well. This week, I'm in our Blanket Fort headquarters for our virtual camp out. Some of you have spent some days this weekend with me virtually camping out, and I hope you've enjoyed that. This week, I have been struggling about what our children's sermon, sermon should be about. Um, this is Ascension Sunday, so I've been thinking that we should be talking about Jesus' ascension into heaven. But there's one verse in our John chapter 17 that has just captured my imagination this week, and I think that that's what our children's sermon should be about. It's chapter John chapter 17, verse 11, where Jesus tells his disciples that he wants them to be one, just like Jesus and the Father are one. Thinking about how Jesus wants us to be together, that we are strengthened when we are together. And I've been thinking about that with just kind of paper. How one sheet of paper, easy to rip, but when you fold it, maybe in half, you can still rip it, but it becomes harder. You fold it one more time, it becomes harder even still. And if you fold again, it becomes almost impossible. One more fold, and I can't even begin to tear. That's what the church is for us. When it brings us together, it makes us stronger. And even though we are not together in our building, we are still the church and we are still together. Going out being Alleluia people. So take care, friends. Know that I'm praying for you. Peace. The first reading is from Acts, the first chapter, verses 6 through 14. Today's reading is part of the introduction to the narrative of the outpouring of the Spirit on Pentecost. These verses tell of the risen Lord's conversation with his disciples on the eve of his ascension, in which he promises that they will receive the power of the Holy Spirit. When the apostles had come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Peter, chapters 4 and 5. Our faith in Christ does not make us immune from the scorn of others. Nevertheless, we are to resist the designs of evil when we experience disparagement from others because we trust God's grace will strengthen and guide us. Beloved, do not be surprised as at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you or to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far that you are sharing Christ's sufferings, so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled from for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. 
Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversity, the devil, prowls around, looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of grace, who has also called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To be to him be the power forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 17th chapter. After Jesus had spoken these words to his disciples, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them. And they have received them and know in truth that I came from you. They have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you have given me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. At first glance, it seems like a strange story to read on this Sunday. This, the last Sunday in the season of Easter. It seems strange to go back to the night before the crucifixion, to that moment of agony and pain as Jesus prepares for the cross that is looming ever larger in the story. Because it hasn't the victory been won, why would we go back there? Why would we dwell in that place of pain when it would be so much easier just to put that all behind us and move forward? Maybe even just to focus on the positive and not, not bother ourselves with things that are hard or difficult. So why now? Why are we hearing this story now? All throughout the season of Easter, we've been hearing stories that help us think more deeply about the power of the resurrection. Stories that more closely connect us to what Jesus did for us on the cross Stories that connect us more deeply to what Jesus did for us in the resurrection, inviting us into the power and promise of this new life. We've heard the story of Jesus meeting the disciples in the locked room. You'll remember they were locked behind closed doors, huddled in fear, and Jesus met them with words of peace, revealed to the disciples his wounds. Remember the story of the walk to Emmaus when Jesus, then a stranger, accompanied two of his followers explained all of scripture to them in, in the breaking of the bread. Their eyes were opened and they knew they were with Jesus. All of these stories give us a glimpse of what it means to be followers of Jesus Christ now in the resurrection. Remember the teaching that Jesus gave that, that he is the good shepherd, that he is the gate, that he is the way, the life, and the truth. All of these are 
stories that are full of power and promise and hope for us, especially in these days when we're not able to physically gather. It's been remarkable to see how these stories connect to our lives, even in, especially in these unfamiliar places and these unfamiliar ways. But so now we go back to that night before the crucifixion. Now we go back to this intimate, holy moment where Jesus is teaching the disciples, withdraws, and now is praying to the Father, this tender, intimate, holy moment. Why would we go back to that place of pain, to that place of agony on the night before the crucifixion? I think there's a human tendency in all of us to avoid things that are hard, to avoid pain, to just focus on the positive. But if we succumb to our temptation, we miss something powerful. And this is a biblical command that has been passed down through all of the generations. Rightly remembering is not a new thing. In fact, in Exodus chapter 12, God commands the newly liberated people that they should always celebrate the Passover so that they remember the hard times in Egypt. They remember the death and destruction and slavery and bondage they were living in. They remember that it wasn't by their own good ideas or own strength that they were delivered, but God was their deliverer. This also gives hope to future generations who will face hard times that they know these stories, that they have heard the stories of God's people facing hardship in the past and trust that God will continue to be their deliverer, that God will continue to be a source of strength and life and salvation. In his final moments, Jesus prays that we would be one, that we would be united. This is one of the hallmarks of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, that we seek to preserve that we seek to create, that we seek to build unity among believers, that we remain united. And Jesus pr prays that we would be protected in this, that we would be preserved in this, that as he ascends to heaven and leaves the world, that God would continue to be at work in our midst, in us and through us. And notice what he says. He says that I am no longer in the world, but they are. That is to say, I am no longer in the world, but they are, and my mission and ministry continues in them as they become the embodiment of the story of salvation. We become the embodiment of Jesus' earthly ministry. It's in us and through us and with us that God is accomplishing these works of salvation, works of justice and mercy and grace. I am no longer in the world, but they are, and they're living this out. They're continuing this work in the new life of the resurrection, empowered by the Holy Spirit. I know these times aren't easy, but I find great hope in the words in the letter of 1 Peter. The author writes, Cast all your cares, all your anxieties, all your worries on God who loves you, on God who cares for you. Of course, this letter was first written to a group of people that were experiencing persecution and hardship as they were exiled into Asia Minor. And even in the midst of their hardship, the author encourages them to shout for joy because God is with them. I wonder if in these moments that we face today, we could find the courage to shout for joy because we know that God is with us. In the midst of our stress and our anxiety and our worries, to know that God is with us and let that good news fill our hearts with great joy. Casting our anxieties, casting our cares, letting those go because we trust that God loves us and that God cares for us. The author also warns that there is an adversary like a roaring lion in their midst. The devil trying to distract them from what is good, trying to devour and consume them. The devil, the roaring lion in our midst today, is not the coronavirus. The devil roaring around us is that voice, that suspicion buried in the back of our brain that we need to protect ourselves at any cost, that we need to preserve and perpetuate this illusion of safety and security that we work so hard to build for ourselves, even if that means damaging our neighbors. It's that temptation to set aside the ways that Jesus 
taught us for these false idols and false hopes. The author of 1 Peter is speaking to that community and I think speaking to us, reminding us to stay steadfast in these ways of love and grace, justice and mercy, rejoicing in the good news that God is with us. So stay strong in your faith in these days. Resist the temptation of that roaring lion, of the adversary, the devil in our midst that would draw us from this mission that Christ has given to us. See so your homework this week. When you feel that worry and anxiety build, remember that God is with you. Remember that God loves you and cares for you and invites you to cast your cares and concerns on him. like to take a moment to invite you to center yourself and pray this prayer that Christians have been praying throughout the generations. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We are all one in Christ, we are one body.
now would you receive the blessing. May the one who brought forth Jesus from the dead raise you to new life, fill you with hope, and turn your mourning into dancing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and keep you now and forever. Amen.